Life is a culmination of our decisions. The question is, are we making the right ones? You're invited to join us at City First Church as we learn biblical principles that will teach us how to make better decisions and have fewer regrets. All right, hello, City First Church family. Come on, put your hands together for Cape Coral, who's joining us right now. Everyone at City First Anywhere. Our favorite locations, God Behind Bars, Dixon and Hardy and everyone on the Pando app. We say hello here from the Spring Creek State Line location. Uh, we are in this uh, last uh, message of our series, How to in 2020. Two, and what we've been talking about are the fact that resolutions become reality when right routines become a priority, all right? We're talking about this the whole month. And before I launch into this today, you heard it on the video, but I just want to put an exclamation point on it. Next week, come and bring your friends, watch online, get a watch party because we have our annual Vision Sunday. And this is always an exciting uh, weekend because what we do is we launch the vision and talk about the theme for the year, and I'm excited about this one. I mean, I'm excited about them all every year, but this one I'm really excited about. So please make sure, do not miss next week, all right? And bring friends, bring family, and invite people. But today, um, I want to talk about the last routine, which is obviously, this is not an exhaustive list. We've been talking about this month. But the last routine this month I want to talk about, about how to find success in your spiritual walk with God as well as in your life in 2022 I want to talk about the routine of fighting, fighting. Now, some of you, the minute I say that, you're thinking, man, I'm already good at this. Like, I fight all the time with my spouse, my parents, my coworkers. Like, like I'm legit good at fighting. No, no, I'm not talking about that kind of fighting. In fact, the Bible even says in 1 Timothy, it says to fight the good, everybody say good, the good fight, uh, not just any fight, the good fight for the true faith, which that denotes that there are good fights and there's bad fights, all right? So we don't want to talk about bad fighting. We're talking about good fighting today. And uh, I want you to know that you're going to fight in life, all right? You're just going to fight. And I hope that you're fighting the right thing, all right? You're fighting the right fight. So today I've entitled my message, You Gotta Fight for the Right, and then that's where I end, right there. Because some of you, I just... I put a lyric in your head, didn't I, didn't I? Some of you that are older, you're like going, oh yeah, I like this morning. <laughs> you got to fight for the right. You got to fight for the right. And today I'm going to talk about a very, very famous Bible story. But here is the temptation. The minute that I introduce to you the story, you're going to go, oh yeah, I heard that before. And you're going to think to yourself, oh, I already know the end of the story. And you might even already know the details of the story. In fact, when you were maybe, if you grew up in church, maybe you were in Sunday school and they had the flanograph. Some of you old enough to remember what a flanograph was? All right, the little felty characters, you know, they put up on the felt board, okay? You know, you're going to be like, I heard about this story way back when. But this is the thing. I want you to dial in today as if you've never heard this story before because I believe there's going to be revelation and truths that are going to come out today that maybe you didn't see before because this is what I know every time I read the Bible it is alive, it is quickened, it is, it is different. Does that make sense? There's a, there's a truth that comes through that maybe I didn't see before or maybe that I need right now that I didn't need the last time that I read that story. So today I want to talk about the battle of David and Goliath, all right? David and Goliath. And most, most of us heard this uh, story before, um, even if it's your first time to church. Uh, you know, you probably heard about David and Goliath before. And this little boy uh, by the name of, of David takes on this giant by the name of Goliath. And to give you a little background on the story, the children of Israel um, are facing their arch enemies, the Philistines. They're in a valley called the Valley of Elah, and uh, it's in the Middle East. And actually, if you were to go there, the topography is you have kind of this like high area, high ground, and then there's this valley, and on the other side, there's this high ground. And we believe that the two armies were on opposite high grounds, um, that you had the children of Israel over here, God's people. You had the Philistines over here. And in the middle, that's where the battle was going to take place. That's where Goliath would come every single day down into the valley, and he'd shout out at God's people, and he would basically threaten them and curse them and taunt them. And this went on for like 40 days, the Bible says. So literally for 40 days, they're at this gridlock. They're just staring at each other, these two armies. But every day, this big old giant, he was over nine feet tall. 
He would come out, his name was Goliath, and he would basically taunt the children of Israel. And it says in the book of 1 Samuel, if you have your Bibles, you can turn them open to 1 Samuel chapter 17. If you don't have a Bible, we say this almost every week, we love to give you a physical Bible. We believe that everybody should have a physical Bible. So if you're in a, like a location, uh, just on the way out the door, go to the next step booth and say, I need a Bible. They'll give you one for free. Or if you're online with us, you can go to our app and follow along, um, or you can just watch on the screens here. But it says in verse 5, Meaning Goliath, he wore a bronze helmet and a coat of mail that weighed 125 pounds. This is just part of his armor. It's not even, it's not even all of his armor, it's just part of it weighed 125 pounds, all right? So put in this perspective for a moment. He also wore bronze leggings and he slung a bronze javelin over his back. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. So you got to think about this. That's the part that goes through you, okay? <laughs> 15 pounds, the tip of his spear, all right? Uh, an armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a huge shield, and every day Goliath would come out of his big old tent, and he would scream, and he'd say this, do you need a whole army to settle this? Choose someone to fight for you, and I'll represent the Philistines. We will settle this dispute in a single combat, if your man is able to kill me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel. Send me a man who will fight with me. When Saul, who by the way was the king of the armies of Israel, when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified. The word terrified, they weren't just scared. They were terrified and deeply shaken. Now, to make this story be applicable to us here in 2022, no matter how old you are or how young you are, whatever age and stage of life you're at, we need to ask this question. The question is, is there anything in your life right now or maybe in the near future that is bigger than you? It's a giant. Now, maybe, maybe it's, it's something you're battling right now, and maybe you've been battling it for a long time, or maybe it's a new battle, or it's something that you know it's on the horizon. And, and you know, it could be work-related, it could be family-related, it could be school-related, it could be personal, it could be a health issue. But honestly, it's a giant in your life. And I will just say this, if there is a giant in your life, then you are a candidate for the power of God. Let me just start off with that tone and that tenor. If there is a giant screaming at you, facing you, guess what? You are a candidate for the power of God to work through you, all right? You got to know that from the get-go of this story. See, maybe your Goliath is, is something that is self-induced. Maybe it's a sin pattern or an addiction or a habit. Or maybe it's not self-induced. Maybe it's a situation or a circumstance that you did not create, but it's holding you back right now. Maybe it's shame. Like you made a mistake in the past and now you have this Goliath of shame that's speaking into you all the time. Maybe it's a crisis. Like all of us have had this Goliath called COVID, right? Like, like it's been a crisis for the last two years. It has been the Goliath to our world. Maybe for you it's a hurt. Maybe somebody, you know, hurt you and you're carrying this hurt and literally this Goliath will not leave you alone. Maybe it's an area in your life that you fail over and over again. But this is what I know. Whatever the Goliath is, whatever it is, it mocks you daily. Like it's in your head. It's in your grill every single day, right? You're thinking about it. It haunts you. And every time you think about that Goliath, you are reminded how weak you are in comparison to how strong you perceive it to be. Does that make sense? Think about this for 40 days. It's a long time. We just read the Bible and we go, oh yeah, 40 days. No, think about this. For 40 days, every day, the armies of Israel would get up, get out of their tents or wherever they slept, and they would assemble together, and I'm sure there was some commander, there was some general somewhere that was like getting everybody like kind of psyched up, like a Braveheart moment. It's like, come on, guys, get together. All right, we're going to defeat the Philistines. We're going to take them on today. And they would get all psyched up, and then they'd go walk over to that high ground, and they would look down in the valley, and they'd see this huge giant mocking them, cursing them, and they'd think to themselves, maybe not today. And the courage would just melt out of them. And it didn't happen, the Bible says, just once a day. It happened twice a day. In fact, it was in the morning 
and it was in the evening, the Bible says, that Goliath would come out. And I thought to myself, I thought, isn't that just the way that the enemy is in our Goliaths? Like you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing on your mind? You go to bed at night, you try to find some sleep, and you can't sleep because what's on your mind, right? It's morning and evening, morning and evening. And this is what I know, day after day after day, it became very defeating because this is what I know. Goliaths, giants, can paralyze us. Like literally, like, like they steal our confidence, they make us second guess who we are, they incapacitate us, and fear in general paralyzes. It paralyzes us. And you know, you, you, I've been talking to a lot of people, even this week, even this week, the reason I think this message is so energized in my spirit is even this week, I've been talking to friends, I've been talking to people around the nation or near here, and I will tell you, they are facing some big giants at work, at school, at home, in their marriages, in their health, and the one common denominator that I'm hearing and what I've experienced when I have faced my Goliath is this, the common denominator is you feel stuck. You're stuck. You don't know what to do. You know, what do I do now? I mean, this Goliath is in my face, screaming at me. I don't know how to get out of this situation. And here's the thing. Goliaths make you want to quit before there's even a battle. I mean, think about this. Like, like here is Goliath. There wasn't even a battle yet. And why does Goliath get to set the terms? Do you notice he said, you send one person down here and we're going to fight. Well, what gives him the right to set the parameters for the battle, Right? And so all of a sudden, he's, he's intimidating, he's putting fear, he's paralyzing, he's making people feel stuck. For 40 days, they were stuck in fear and paralysis. Honestly, I think, I'm not, I'm preaching to the choir here, you know this, it's gripped our world for the last two years. It's made our world stuck, like literally. You know, the virus is, is very real. I've been talking about it from time to time or, you know, each weekend. Um, it's not that I'm trying to beat the dead horse here. It's just this is, like, real. Like, we face it every day, right? It is a real virus. It's not made up. It is real. And it has changed the way that we live. Now, I'm not going to debate the origin of the virus. I'm not going to debate how we eliminate the virus. I'm not even going to talk about how we've dealt with the virus because there are thousands of different opinions about that. If you're curious, just go online. I'm not going to debate any of these things. You know what I want to just say? Elevate above your politics for a minute or your opinions. Can you agree with me? It has changed the psyche of our culture. It's literally changed the psyche, the way we see, the way we think. In fact, um, about a year ago in uh, 2021, I was flying back from our Cape location, and, and, and uh, Jen and myself and Paxton, our little 10-year-old down there, uh, we were down there doing ministry, and then Jen had to stay back to do some more ministry. I was coming back here, and so I was flying alone with Paxton, and uh, we were sitting, um, like, in, you know, our airplane seat, you know, flying along. He has his little iPad. He has his headphones on. He's watching a movie. And I don't know why, but there's certain times, it seems like the route from Chicago to Fort Myers, it's really bumpy during certain seasons. It's like, literally, they need to smooth out, like, the, the potholes or something. But, I mean, it's just like, it's like this the whole way. And so, the whole way, he's, you know, watching his movie and stuff like this. We get about 20 minutes outside of Chicago, and all of a sudden, he looks at me, and um, for those of you who don't know, you know, Paxton has Down syndrome, so sometimes he, he, he can't communicate real well and, and real clearly, but he just looks at me, and he has his headphones on, he has his iPad, and he just hands me his iPad. And I'm like, well, this is strange. And he just looks at me, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, something's wrong. And he starts doing this and doing this, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and I am like, I'm going to the seat back in front of me, I'm trying to find the little bag. You know what I mean? which half of the seat backs don't have the bag. And I'm like searching, I'm reaching across. And, and man, at that moment, he lost his cookies. Now, I've been on flights before. I've been on flights where people lose their cookies, like on some really rough flights. And I mean, I've been on flights before where people are, are, are throwing up like a symphony. It's like blah, 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 puke, 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 puke. You know what I mean? Like, honestly, it's like, but... What had happened was I knew immediately he had motion sickness because he's been watching a screen for two hours as we've been doing this. But it's in the middle of COVID. Like it's 2021. And I want to tell you, the plane started to freak out. Like I'm watching people like look at me like all of a sudden like Paxton had the black death. And like it was the plague of London. And all of a sudden, you know, like everybody was just kind of like scooting away, like all of a sudden. And you know what? It's so interesting. Isn't it crazy? Like even if you cough nowadays, 
Okay, it's changed the psyche. It's changed the psyche, and it reminds me of this, this um, message that C.S. Lewis gave. Now, C.S. Lewis, he's the author of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and The Chronicles of Narnia. Most of you know him for that. He actually was a great theologian. He's one of my favorite theologians, actually. Um, he was kind of, in, in many ways, looked at as the Billy Graham of the World War II era in the UK. Um, he didn't hold crusades, but rather than said he'd have a radio program on the BP, BBC, and, and he would write. and He wrote a lot of theological books that are really good, by the way. And this is what he said after World War II, after the atomic bomb was made, and, you know, obviously was dropped on, on Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki and things like that. And, and, you know, when that happened, all of a sudden that technology went into some of the other countries' hands that maybe were enemies, like the USSR and things like that. And there was this, like, fear around the world. Some of you remember this. There was this fear that all of a sudden there was going to be a dropping of the atomic bomb. And in the U.K., they really feared that. And so there's this paralyzing fear. And this is what he said. I want you to listen closely. He said, the way that we think a great deal too much, in a way we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb, how we are to live in an atomic age, I'm tempted to reply, why? As you would have lived during the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year. Or you would have lived in a Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat at night. Or indeed, as you are already living in the age of cancer, the age of syphilis, the age of paralysis, and the age of air raids, an age of a railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin to ex by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madame, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented. A quite high percentage of us we're going to die in unpleasant ways. We had indeed one very great advantage over our ancestors, anesthetics, but we have that still. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all but a certainty." This is the first point to be made, and the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, uh, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things, praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint and a game of darts, not huddled together, frightened sheep, like frightened sheep, and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, a microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds. And I read that and I thought, oh, we need that advice today. Now listen to me, bravery is not foolishness. And foolishness is not bravery. The virus is real. But I want you to know how you perceive it on, in here is the difference on whether you are paralyzed or you live life. And in the same way thousands of years ago, these Israelites were standing on the side of a valley on a high top area, and they were paralyzed. See, Here's the thing, Saul the king was fixated on worst case scenarios and if you live your life always fixated on worst case scenarios, you will be paralyzed. And along comes this little teenage boy and some even theologians believe he was like 11 or 12 years old, maybe in preteen. And his name is David, and he's back with his father, and his brothers are on the battle fronts, and, and he's back with his dad living at home, and his dad says, hey, take some food to your brothers. And so all of a sudden he shows up on the front lines, and he sees this, this Goliath, this giant down in this valley, and he's confused as what's going on because he sees his people, the Israelites over here, and the Philistines over here, and everybody's just standing there. And all of a sudden he says this in 1 Samuel 17, 26. And David spoke to the men who were standing by him saying, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach, this reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine 
that he should taunt the armies of the living God. I love this kid. I love this kid. I mean, he, he, he just comes up there and he's like going, what are we doing here? <laughs> What's going to be given to the man that takes this giant out? Who is this giant? Now, now listen, he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And some of you might go, was that a cuss word back then? Like, you know? Like, is that like calling somebody a name? Like, you little, you know what I mean? That kind of a thing. Is that what, what's going on here? No, no. What is actually happening here is David is making a very important distinction. Because I'm not going to go into this. It's way too long to explain. It's a sermon on itself, and it'd be a really weird sermon. But anyway, the, uh, the Old Testament said that circumcision was something that God had commanded his people to do when infants were very small, male infants were very small, to circumcise them. And here's the reason why. It was a physical symbol of a spiritual covenant between God and man. And it dated all the way back to Abraham. And God said that the Israelites, his people, were going to be different, not just physically. They're going to be different spiritually. And that guess what? They would have a unique protection, a unique favor, and unique promises that God said only his people would have, not everyone else. So what David is saying here, in layman's terms, as he calls him an uncircumcised Philistine, is he's saying this. He's saying, hey, wait a minute. They're, that's not one of us. The promises of God are for us, us Israelites. The promises of God, the protection of God is for us. That guy isn't even in covenant with our God. He doesn't have favor. We have the favor. This guy doesn't have the strength. We have the supernatural strength. This guy is not in covenant. That giant is not in covenant. Those Philistines are not in covenant with the Almighty God. We're in covenant. Why are you all shaking in your boots? Why are y'all sitting here? Why are we attacking? Because God is on our side, not his side. See, that's what he was saying. And this is the thing, because a covenant, because a covenant that now we have with Jesus is Jesus as the leader and the forgiver of our life, our Lord and our Savior, we are now in covenant with the Almighty God, which means this, that we have unique protection, unique promises, unique favor, you need strength. We have access to the supernatural power of God. In other words, we have a right to it. We have a right to it. And our Goliath does not have the right. We have the right. And that's why Saul had forgotten his rights. He had forgotten who he was and who he was connected to and who he was in relationship with. And that happens a lot of times when we face a Goliath. When we face a Goliath, we forget our right. We forget the fact that we have access to an almighty God who loves us, who gives us supernatural power and healing and favor and strength. We forget it, and that is why we must fight for the right. We must remember in our mind that we fight not just for the right, but with the right. We remember that the enemy is always trying to steal our peace, but we have a right to our peace. And the reason why is because Jesus said, I've told you these things that you may have peace. Jesus said we have a right to peace. So the enemy can't take it. Now, some of us might go, well, listen, uh, my, my enemy, the enemy is coming against my marriage, my business, my family. The giant is taunting these things. Well, listen, you have a right to protection over those things. In fact, it says in 2 Thessalonians, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and Guard you from the evil one. That's a right. That's a promise. You can stand on the word of God and say, devil, you can't touch my family. You can't touch my business. You can't touch those things. Because I'm in covenant with God. The enemy will come and try to steal your health. And you got to remind him what it says in Psalm 91, where God says, I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. So the enemy, the enemy comes and tries to taunt you and tries to steal your health. And you're like, no, 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 I have access to supernatural power and healing. In fact, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. And that he heals all my sicknesses, it says in Psalms. And he forgives all my sins. The enemy comes in and tries to steal your purpose. And when he tries to steal your purpose, you remind him of what he said in Exodus, what God said. But I have spared you for a purpose, to show you my power and to spread my fame throughout the earth. So God 
wants to give you a purpose, and it's a promise, and it's a right. See, the enemy is always going to act like he has the right to steal the promises of God from you. But you need to fight for the right. And the fight is in here. The fight isn't out here. It's in here. It's how you perceive it. It's how you perceive it. And through Jesus, you are in covenant. You are made in the image of God. He loves you. He protects you. He cares for you. He has a purpose for you, and his promises are for you. And I don't understand why everything happens. I don't. I don't understand why everything happens, but this is what I know. I know that Goliath can't just come in and lay claim to those things. He can't just come in and take them. In other words, you're in covenant, I'm in covenant, and his tactic is to always lie and make us think we don't have a right, and we don't have access to the promises of God, or everybody else does, and not us. So along comes this little shepherd boy, right, David, and, and, and he remembers his rights, <laughs> He remembers what God promised, and he looks and he goes, who is this uncircumcised, out of covenant, lying, nine foot plus giant? Who is this? Who is he saying that he has more power, more power than our almighty God? King, King Saul, give me a shot. Give me a shot. Let me, let me go take him out. You see, and, and I love this. I love this because at that point, Saul looks at him and says, there is no way you can go against this Philistine. You're only a boy, and he has been in the army since he was a boy. Here's the king of Israel, Saul. And he's standing there for 40 days, powerless. What a terrible leader. <laughs> Seriously, powerless. Like, like, as a leader, talking about him as a leader. I'm, uh, this, this is terrible leadership. For 40 days, he just, he, he hasn't led we don't have any record in the word of God that he even petitioned God for help. That, that he never rallied his troops and said, come on guys, God is in our, on our side. He literally just stood there and listened to the taunting of the giant insult him, his people, and his God. He just took it. You know what a crisis does? It does not make a person. It reveals a person. So many people are like, well, a crisis makes you. No, it doesn't. It reveals you. It reveals what you really believe. <laughs> It reveals what you really think, what you really, how you see the world, right? And, and here, David has more courage than the king. Isn't that amazing? Crisis on the outside requires conviction on the inside. And David had a conviction, and Saul had cowardice. That was it. And so we pick up here, and in verse 34, it says, But David persisted. I've taken care of my father's sheep, he said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club, and I take the lamb from its mouth, and if the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw, and I club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who saved me from the claws of the lion and the bear will save me from this Philistine. I mean, again, I love this kid. I can't wait someday to meet David. You know what I mean? I can't wait. In heaven, I can't wait. I'm going to be like, what was it like? You know what I mean? I, you see, here's the thing. This is the first step in, in conquering our, our Goliath, our, our, our giant, is that when facing a giant, we have to remember the past victories God gave us. We have to remember how he's been faithful before. Hey, listen, this isn't your first rodeo. You, you've, been, you've been through other battles before. Some of you have been like through big battles before. This isn't your first rodeo. And guess what? God brought you through it. You're here today, right? You're like, yeah, I have some scars. Yeah, but you're living. Okay, here's the thing. The Bible never promises we won't have scars. <laughs> but the Bible promises that Jesus will get us through. And so here's the thing. That, that I look at it and I go, you gotta look back to that last battle, that last giant, and you gotta say, God was faithful then. Guess what? He'll be faithful now. But I know what your argument is. Your argument is, yeah, but that was a smaller giant. This giant's bigger. This is a bigger giant. True. And the bigger the giant, the harder they fall. <laughs> the bigger the giant, the more God can exercise his power and get fame and glory for it. The bigger the giant, the bigger the miracle. So, Saul tries to put on, you know, the armor, his armor on David and says, okay, I'm going to give you all this armor and you can go ahead and go give it a shot. I mean, th what this really is, is Saul just resigning himself to the fact that he's going to be a slave. He's like, fine, go kid, take my armor. And David's like, I don't want your armor. <laughs> Instead, he went down to a creek and he picked up five smooth rocks out of the water, takes his little slingshot, 
And this is what the Bible says in verse 41. Goliath walked out towards David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick. And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. Full stop. He's yelling at David. Now, could you picture this? Here's this little boy. Here's Goliath cursing him, yelling at him, right? So what's David's response? David shouted in reply. David did not whisper. He did not calmly reply. He did not go, uh, excuse me, Mr. Goliath, but that ain't true. You know? No, no. What does it say? He shouted in reply. Okay, notice these things when you read the Word of God. Like, there was an aggression that came out in David, right? You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel, and everyone will know that the Lord does not need weapons to rescue his people. It is his battle and not ours. The Lord will give you to us. Oh, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, David's like, oh, no, you ain't going to do me like that. I'm going to tell you right now what I'm going to say. God is on my side. The battle belongs to him. And today, devil, I'm going to defeat you, not because of my strength, but because of God's strength through me. Devil, you're going to be the one that goes down. Devil, you're the one whose head is coming off. Devil, you're going down. <laughs> I thought to myself, I thought, you know what? Here, here's a truth when we face our Goliath, and, and this is for some of us today, all right? Listen, when facing your giant, be aggressive. Get a little fire in you. Don't come out and nicely ask Goliath to leave. He must get out. There needs to be an effort, an aggression. Get a little ticked off at the enemy. I mean, you hear me every once in a while, I'll get up here, and I've had a, a week. This week, I've had a week, all right? And, and there's a part of me, I'm like, oh, no, devil. <laughs> Satan, not today. <laughs> No, 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 because half-hearted attacks do not take out big Goliaths. So sometimes we have to do what the fourth, you know, century Roman writer said, where he said, let him who, who desires peace prepare for war. There needs to be a little war in you. Get some fire in you. You know what? Get a little frustrated about the enemy, how he's messing with your kids how he's messing with your health, how he's messing with your wife, how he's messing with your husband, how he's messing with your workplace, your neighborhood. Get a little fire in you. And, and this is why I know it takes work and it takes prayer and it takes conviction, it takes effort, it takes time. But our society has just kind of surrendered, I think, sometimes to the giants in their lives. And I think part of the reason is, is because we have so many blessings. And some of you are like going, what do you mean? Well, blessings either make you grateful or they make you weak. And we have a lot of blessings. There's this uh, 2016 post-apocalyptic fictional writing that uh, a book called Those Who Remain. It was interesting. The author wrote it this way. Hard times create strong men, and strong men create good times. But good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. And I will tell you, we in our society, we've been blessed. But the minute that we start thinking that we have it so hard, let's go back a few hundred years or even a few thousand years to how people had to live. I mean, like, like we're, we're frustrated when, when we don't get the, the right type of meat because of a supply chain issue. And 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, they were just happy to eat. You see, here's the thing. We need to get a little bit of a fire in our bones and a little perspective and context and say, hey, listen, first of all, you know what? God is going to give us a victory. And, and secondly, we're going to make it through this. It's not the end of the world. And thirdly, I'm going to start talking to my Goliath with a little bit of an aggression. And I'm going to not be nice anymore. And I'm going to stand up and I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight for the right. 
because I'm in covenant with the Lord. He loves me, he protects me. His promises are still for you. He's not forgotten you. He loves you and he cares for you and he's with you even when you don't feel it. So get a little aggressive. And I love this last part before I close. In verse 48, it says this, as Goliath moved closer to the attack, David ran quickly or quickly ran. David quickly ran. I love this. So the Goliath is coming at him. And instead of, uh, instead of a matrix move, okay, instead of that, <laughs> some of you get it. <laughs> instead, what did David do? He ran towards the enemy. See, see, that's how confident he was that he was in covenant with God and that he would be victorious. He ran. He didn't cower. He didn't wait. He ran, it says. And he ran out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it from his sling and hit the four Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face downward to the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine giant with only a stone and a sling. And since he had no sword, he ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath. David used it to kill the Goliath and cut off his head. What the enemy is bringing at you as a weapon, God will turn it against him. Do you hear that? He's going to turn it against him. I love that. And when Philistines saw their champion was dead, they turned and ran. Then the Israelites gave a great shout of triumph. Oh, now all of a sudden you all get faith. Right? And it says they rushed after the Philistines. You know what that tells me? What that tells me is this, is sometimes it only takes one person. It only takes one person in the family to say, no one else is fighting for this family, so I'm gonna fight for this family. No one else is getting mad at the enemy because the enemy is tearing us apart. I'm gonna get mad at the enemy and I'm gonna start claiming the word of God and I'm gonna start going to battle. See, some people say, you know, if no one else in the neighborhood is gonna stand up and do what's right, I'm gonna do what's right. And if no one else at the company is going to fight, I'm going to fight for the right things. I'm going to fight for people. I'm going to fight for my friend who's sick. I'm going to do it. If no one else is going to do it, I'm going to do it. And then this is the thing. In the same way that fear is contagious, bravery is contagious also. Faith is contagious. Who knows that you're not the catalyst of faith for your family, for your neighborhood, for your friendship group, for the business you work at? Who knows that you aren't the catalyst of faith? And at first, people might just stand there and go, what's that kid doing taking on that Goliath? This is crazy. But guess what? When Goliath begins to fall, guess what? All of a sudden, they're going to be like, yes. And they're going to be in, and they're going to be full of faith. Sometimes it just takes one person. So I want to pray for us. I want to pray that we would be that one person who remembers we need to fight for the right. We remember we're in covenant and the promises of God are yes and amen. And they are for us and they're for your family and for your health and for your business and your finances and your addictions and everything else. That there is an answer, but it takes a little bit of fight, a little bit of aggression and a lot of faith. So let me pray. Lord, I pray right now. I pray for each and every person with an earshot of my voice, whether they be in this room or online or in another room. God, I pray that there would be a holy fire that comes into them after this message and that there would be this sense of fight, the good fight, the right kind of fight, not the wrong kind of fighting, the right kind of fighting, of standing up and saying, Satan, not today, not today. I am a child of God, and the promises of the Word of God are yes and amen, and I will stand on them for my family, for my health, for my finances, for my place of work, for my school, for my church, for my neighborhood, for my community. I will stand, and if I'm the only one standing, I will stand. So Lord, even though the giant is there, the victory belongs to you, and you will bring it to your glory in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody, stand up. Let's sing.
Church, God loves you and he is with you and he is for you. Hey, would you give Pastor Jeremy a round of applause? What an amazing message.